Hello, welcome to this seventh lecture organized by Texas Family Enrichment and presented to you by um, Anna Samuel. The title of today's talk is um, Helping Our Children Navigate the Gender Ideology. So hello, Anna, how are you doing? Anna is joining us from uh, Princeton, uh, New Jersey, actually Lawrenceville. In New Jersey. Um, so we're very happy to have Anna present this important topic to, to you. Uh, Anna um, is a PhD graduate of Princeton University and the University of Notre Dame, where she completed doctoral work on the political theory and sexual ethics of Montesquieu. She was the first executive director of the Witherspoon Institute at its foundation in 2003 and subsequently transitioned to a research and teaching role in 2010, focusing on research in family uh, structure studies. She edited No Differences, How Children in Same-Sex Households Fare, and directed the development of the new Family Structure Studies website. In 2013, she helped to launch Canavox, where she serves as academic director of the reading groups worldwide. Every summer, she enjoys teaching the dialogues of Plato and Aristotle's moral philosophy to high school students for the Witherspoon Institute's summer seminars. She is married and has six children. After her lecture, Anna will answer two or three questions or maybe a little bit more if we have the time um, from you, from the audience. If you want to submit those questions, please use the Q&A button on your screen and not the chat. Um, so we appreciate that. Well, and without further ado, Anna, um, you're more than welcome to start your presentation. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Pilar, for having me. It's really a pleasure to team up with Texas Family Enrichment for what I consider to be one of the most important topics of our time. I think we're all here today um, because we're concerned about the hypersexualization of our culture. I think we're here because we're concerned about the widespread adoption of gender ideology in our culture. It's become widespread in television programming, movies, in school curricula, social media, in conversations that our children are around. And the subsequent and the simultaneous censoring of alternative viewpoints. And all these things to various degrees are affecting our freedom to raise our children according to our family's traditional values, the timeless values that many families hold about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be married, and what a family environment, a healthy family environment is for children. And I think as adults, we're rightly concerned and we're looking for support. And uh, I hope very much that uh, the Canavox can serve in this role. So today I basically have two aims for this talk. In the short time, I want to pack in as much as I can in two big areas. The first is to talk a little bit about relational apologetics. What is relational apologetics? It's the idea that getting our relationships right with our children or putting them right is as important or perhaps more important than whatever arguments and reasons we give our kids about the truth of marriage or what it means to be man or woman or et cetera. Because as Josh McDowell once said, rules without relationship breeds rebellion. And so the first part of my talk, I wanna talk about five tips that at Canavox we really honed in on to make sure that we are maximizing the quality of our relationship with our children so that we can have the right framework for talking to them about gender ideology and LGBTQ issues. And the second part of the talk, I'm just gonna launch into frequently asked questions that children ask, children from all different ages, like what does gay mean? What does our family think about gay people? What does our family think about kids who have two moms or two dads or several different homes? What does transgender mean? What do we think about gay adoption? And how am I supposed to interact with people who think so differently from us, um, who identify as gay or as transgender, et cetera? 
So in the second part of the talk, I will get into some of the suggested talking points on those things because the world has answers to these questions and the world is doing a very good job of communicating its answers to our children. But I don't think the world is really giving our children truthful answers. So that's why I'm here today to try to help equip you to give your kids different answers from the ones you're hearing. Good. So let's just launch in to the idea of building a really great relationship with our kids. And the first tip is really to make sure you're fostering a lot of intimacy with them from a very young age. It's about having frequent one-to-one -one conversations with your kids about what is on their heart and mind. Meg Meeker says that one way to remember what intimacy means is with a mnemonic, into me see. It's about letting your child see into your heart and revealing who you are to them and inviting them to reveal what's on their heart and what's worrying them. So it's about having lots of conversations with them about anything, what's worrying them today, why are they so happy? What did they think about school recess today? Anything is game. Friend issues, personal worries, academic matters, questions about the meaning of life. As the parent, you want to try to be working towards a very personalized direction with your children. In our household, my kids came up with a code word that I love to share in these talks because it's such a practical tip. My kids came up with the word talky talk. So they, every time they wanted to talk to us about something that was on their mind, they would say, mom, I wanna have a talky talk or dad, can I have a talky talk? And this was basically code for, I have something important I wanna ask you. I wanna go somewhere privately without my siblings listening in on the conversation. And if possible, I wanna do it now. And it, this, this little code word has worked so great in our family, because as you know, when you're rushing here and there trying to get things done, you can often miss the cues that your child is giving to sort of when he needs to talk. So by them having a word to drop and tell you like, I really need to talk right now, it opens up the lines of communication very effectively. So try to have as many talky talks as you can with your kids. And of course, when they get older, they're not gonna call it a talky talk, but what you're doing is you're getting them accustomed to opening up with you about important matters. Second tip, is to speak in natural law, especially when you're talking about sexuality and gender issues. A lot of families speak to their kids about what their faith tradition teaches or what the Bible says or what the church says about a certain matter. And there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But in today's climate, it's not enough. Our kids need to know why we believe what we believe, not simply what we believe or what the church believes, but why, what are the reasons, what are the common sense biological reasons? Why, are, why does natural law say these things are so? If we send our kids out into the world with only an understanding of what Genesis teaches, I think we're doing them, we're leaving them sort of naked in the line of battle. We need to give them better reasons. And also I've seen, especially here on the campus of Princeton, that a lot of kids, when they get to college, they sort of pass through this time in their life where they sort of experience doubts about their faith and they may temporarily even shed their faith for a few years only to retake it up again later as their own. But during those years when they stop practicing the faith, it's really important that they have the natural law arguments for the truth of sexuality so that it will fortify them in that vulnerable time of life. So it's really good for you to give them a great foundation that's secular. The next tip is to stay calm. If you're doing what I'm saying, if you're building intimacy with your kids and if you have a good relationship of communication with them, there's gonna come the time when they're gonna come and ask you something that is gonna shock you. Um, you know, they might come and say, mom, like the guys at the lunch table were talking about masturbation and I really didn't know what to do or say. And in your head, you might be thinking masturbation, like, don't they have a sense of privacy? Like why, what are they doing talking about this at the lunch table? And isn't this a Christmas school? Aren't their parents teaching them blah, blah, blah. But on the outside, you have to stay completely calm and act like it's a completely natural and normal question, right? Not launch into some sort of freak out moment with your kid because you need to communicate to them that you are exactly the right person for them to come to. 
if you freak out or if you don't stay calm, you're sending them the message that it's better to go Google the answer or talk to your friends because mom and dad can't really take it. So you may have to put on an Academy Award winning performance, right? Staying calm. Wow, that does sound like a really difficult situation. Like, what did you do? So that you can enter into a conversation and think it through with them. The fourth tip is to always strive to speak in an age appropriate way with your kids. This can be especially tricky when it comes to matters of sexuality. And at Canavox, we've developed a kind of rule of thumb for guiding parents on how much to expose our kids to and at what age. So what we recommend is from the age of one to 10, you really want to expose them to the truth and keep the ideals very, very clear. This is the age of sheltering them from false information and from errors, right? So you want them to have very clear in their mind what marriage is, one man, one woman, open to kids, loving family. You want them to have very clear examples of healthy females, healthy males, and as much as possible, protect them from confusing examples because you want them to have a very good baseline understanding of what the truth is. From the age of 10 to 15, we recommend that you really begin to now open their eyes to the errors in the culture you start to lean in and help build the filter. So basically you want them to learn to face realities and start to understand that in the world, there are a lot, there's a lot of confusion. And so this is the age when an LGBT issue comes up or you see an opportunity to talk about an LGBT issue, start to talk about it. All the while reminding them of the truth of marriage and sexuality, but pointing out that unfortunately in our culture, there are a lot of mistakes. And then during the 15 to 18 year old stage, this is the time when you have to really give them a lot more freedom. You're gonna to continue to coach them, but let them take the lead more and try to let them do what is right on their own. Let them make mistakes while they're living with you. So as you can see at Canavox, we really believe that at the tender age of 10 to 15 is when you really focus on forming them very, very well in areas of sexuality. Now, I know from experience that a lot of parents are gonna balk at this um, because they're gonna prefer to protect their children from the lies and shelter them as much as possible through middle school and absolutely as long as possible in high school as well. But on behalf of all the Canavox state leaders, I really would love for you to reconsider that strategy. When kids are younger, when they're in the 10 to 15 year old age, they tend to have more goodwill and trust towards their parents. They're more likely to listen to you and believe what you mom and dad say on a particular issue. In addition, they're not yet fully tempted by sexual things, so they don't feel personally judged or attacked when these matters are brought up. So the 10 to 15 age really offers you a golden window of opportunity to really help form them. It's not too late if you waited later, but I'm just trying to outline an ideal. The fifth tip is to practice a kind of moral balance in your speech. So when you're dealing with very tricky moral issues, I think we have to message a combination of ideas that involve showing empathy and mercy towards people who do not understand the truth, but also communicate the truth and the justice of the matter very, very clearly. So most people are good at, very good at either the virtues of the left and poor at the virtues of the right or vice versa. So progressives tend to put much more weight into the empathy and mercy side of the equation and conservatives tend to put much more emphasis on the truth and justice of these issues. But I think that to have a well-balanced and complete answer on LGBT issues, we really need to hit the four areas well and pursue, pursue a very balanced approach so that our kids understand that everything we say comes from a place of love and compassion. So that's my brief primer on five of the areas that we consider to be really important when it comes to the relational apologetics with your children. So let's turn now to some of the frequently asked questions. Okay, what does gay mean? 
if you're talking to a young child, maybe elementary school, maybe middle school, I think the important thing is to first try to find out the context, all right? The answer you give will depend a lot on what the context was. So did they hear it as an insult? Did some kid call another kid gay to try to insult him? Or was it used simply as a descriptive word like, oh, he's gay, you know? Um, or did they hear it on television or did they read about it in a book? Find out the context calmly. If it was used as an insult, we need to be very clear with our children that under no circumstances is it ever acceptable to use this word as an insult, right? Um, however, it may have been used not as an insult, but as a simple statement of so-called fact. So you can say something more or less on the following lines. The gay person is somebody who has a crush on somebody of the same sex or somebody who has romantic feelings or they want to marry somebody of the same sex. However, only a man and a woman can get married because only a man and a woman can make a baby. So they're a little bit confused, right? I'm talking to a really young child, right? We're keeping it simple. Be very careful not to say a gay person is somebody who loves somebody of the same sex. So, you know, we, I don't know about you, but I, I love a lot of people of the same sex and that doesn't make me gay. But this is the way the progressive gay lobby wants us to define what it means to be gay, that it's just somebody who loves somebody of the same sex because they want us to believe that we're all a little gay. But if you tell a child something like that, not only is it false and deceitful, but it will make them question if maybe they're gay because they love their friends, right? So it's really important, I think, to distinguish between friendship love and romantic love, that it's like, it's a crush, all right? Other topics that you can talk about with young kids are how important it is for boys to have really great friendships with other boys and how important it is for girls to have great friendships with other girls. But these friendships are very different from romantic friendships and they're, and it's not appropriate to be falling in love with somebody of the same sex. Keep it simple. However, if it's an older student, all right, once they're in high school, your child may see somebody come out as, as gay. They may have a friend who identifies as gay and they may ask you for help, helping think things through a little bit more. So I think the first step is to help our teenagers distinguish between simple same-sex attractions and gay identity, because it's a totally different thing. Some people experience same-sex attractions and they simply need to describe that feeling accurately, either to their family or friends or to a therapist or a close friend. Whereas other people take the additional step of adopting the gay identity, which is not a mere description of feelings, but it's more of a declaration. Right? It's a, usually a more public declaration. And today it's usually taken to mean a declaration of the gay lifestyle. So explain to your kids, when, when young people experience feelings of same-sex attraction, they need to be given time and space to process those feelings, to think about this calmly in the privacy of their hearts in the context of loving relationships and people who know about this issue so that they can figure out how they're gonna live their life as a free man or as a free woman. The problem right now is that the gay lobby hands kids a social script and it sort of hijacks that process of discernment and rushes kids, it pressures kids to adopt the gay social script, right? So what is a social script? It's good to explain to our kids what the gay social script is. Well, first, a social script is like a code of conduct, right? A social script is what ex is expected to, of us in any kind of situation. So for example, when you're at the movies, there's a social script of how you should behave. You should turn off your phone, be quiet, et cetera. If you're at a board meeting, there's a social script for how you participate in a board meeting. If you're at, at, the, at a soccer game watching your kid play, there's a social script what appropriate behavior is for parents on the sidelines, right? Like a movie script a social, that an actor reads, a social script prescribes us guidelines for what appropriate behavior is. So right now the gay lobby is extending tremendous pressure on young people who experience same-sex attractions 
to follow the social script from the gay lobby. So what is the gay script? It says, first of all, that same-sex attractions are good and natural. Your same-sex attractions tell you who you really are. This is your identity. It's the core of who you are. Failing to make gay your primary identity is repressive and harmful. Sexual behaviors, same-sex behaviors that match your identity are crucial for your fulfillment. And finally, welcome to the club. You will find many friends and allies here. So as you can see, this is probably a very attractive script for a young person who's having confused feelings that they quite don't know how to process. And while the world may view this gay script as progressive and open-minded, it's actually a very narrow-minded way to define a person. Because this script makes our sexual feelings the master of our identity and everything else becomes the slave. And it's as if our sexual feelings were the most part, important part of our identity. And in any other context, I mean, it would be so bizarre for us to identify ourselves primarily by our sexual feelings, right? I mean, it would be so strange for us to all adopt the strategy, but this is exactly what the gay lobby is asking of young people. So teach your young teenagers to look at this script sort of objectively to step out of it. They're gonna recognize it right away because if they're in, in public school or in any school today, they're gonna to be pounded by this sort of script. So they're gonna recognize it immediately. So by, by naming it, what you're doing is you're giving them the ability to step outside of it and sort of judge the merits of the script. And then you can teach them that instead there's something way more fundamental to the center of who we are and that's our human nature, our common humanity, all right? And our humanity is made up of both body and soul. So our body and soul are so closely connected that what we do with our body intimately affects our soul and what we do with our soul affects our body, right? So part of, part of what we have to do battle with, if you'll forgive the expression, is that the gay lobby is adopting a philosophical position called dualism, which wants to separate identity from the body. It wants to create this dichotomy between our soul or who we truly are and our body, which is not really part of us. And that philosophical worldview is opposed to the realistic worldview that the natural law tradition holds. The natural law tradition holds that we are both body and soul and that my body is an important part of who I am. Now you're not gonna get into all this philosophy with your teenager necessarily, but I want you, the adults, the parents to know that there is actually a, a big philosophical battle at stake in this debate, all right? So when we explain to our kids, that our bodies and our souls are one, they're together, a united part of who we are, you're taking a huge philosophical stake in this debate, all right? So explain to them that a critical aim of our bodies includes our ability to reproduce as either male or female. And if we go against that bodily design, we damage both our body and our soul because same-sex actions go directly against our natural design and they misuse our body parts. But more than that, these acts cause like a kind of psychic dissonance, a kind of disintegration of the body and the mind. And this inflicts a deep psychic wound, all right? So explain these things to your teen and then offer them an alternate script, all right? So what's the alternate script? The natural law script, okay. Natural law says some people experience same-sex attractions. This does not mean that they are broken or bad, but our sexual feelings do not define us or determine our identity. We mustn't give them more importance than they merit. Three, our identity is grounded in our human nature, a body-soul unity. Same-sex behaviors go against that identity and they are harmful. We can choose to integrate our sexual feelings into our human identity. And finally, and on a positive note, everybody is worthy of great love, right? Strong friendships are going to be the key 
for self-fulfillment and happiness, not only for people who have same-sex attractions, but for all of us, because all of us can live without romantic love, but we cannot live without friendship love. Friendship love is more fundamental than all of that. So obviously I'm pecking a lot into a very small space, and these talking points really can provide us with a lifetime of reflection material. And hopefully you'll be inspired to join Canavox and look into this a little bit more deeply. But if I had to map out in five minutes, the most important talking points when it comes to explaining the gay lobby's identity proposal versus natural law tradition, this is how I would pack it into five minutes. Next question. So what does our family think of gay people, right? And you can say, our family believes every person has innate dignity. And that dignity does not depend upon their sexual feelings, their political affiliation, their religious values, their behaviors, the pigment of their skin, whether they're brilliant in mathematics or special needs. It doesn't depend on any of that. We believe that all human beings have intrinsic worth and dignity. And we extend friendship to anybody who seeks our friendship, all right? Now, just because we respect and honor every person in our midst because of their humanity, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything they say or do, all right? We can love our friends and disagree with them at the same time. Now, this is tricky business because we need to be true to who we are as well, okay? And we need to be able to believe what we believe and be uncompromising about the truth. But we have to be very compromising and full of compassion and patience towards people, right? So we have to tell our kids that we have to have a very strong sense of respect for the freedom of conscience of others and understand that everybody needs time and space to discover the truth, okay? And if we love and respect our gay friends and family and our neighbors, we will reach out in friendship to them without any awkwardness, okay? And with a calm sense of trust that if we truly do love and respect them and at the same time are true to our beliefs and who we are, it will generate deeper reflection about what they believe and what we believe, right? We also learn when we are asked to come into contact with people who have very different values, it causes us to reflect more deeply. It's a win-win situation. Um, so we tell our kids we love them and we're not gonna hit them over with our rules and our value systems. We extend friendship to them, but at the same time, we, we, we have to be true to who we are and we welcome an opportunity to witness to the truth. So hopefully you're practicing this teaching, right? Hopefully you're already showing your children with deeds and various actions that everybody around you is worthy of respect, including your gay colleagues and your neighbors and your friends, because if you walk the walk, they will believe the talk. But what does our family think of gay marriage? Okay, so now we're moving away from simply personal moral views about gay identity to more of a legal and public policy question, okay? So you can say to your kids, all right, the United States Supreme Court changed the definition of marriage. Just a few years ago, it wasn't this way, but today it's the law of the land that two men or two women can enter into a civil marriage. However, we believe that this change is contrary to natural law and it's very harmful to children. It's contrary to the rights of children. And then you have to explain that, okay? So why is it against natural law? Marriage is not primarily about adult feelings, okay? Especially from the civil political point of view, Marriage, first and foremost, is about justice. Justice between the adults that are entering into a sexual relationship and justice towards any children that are created as a result of that sexual relationship. So reflect with your kids. Every time that a child is created, a man and a woman are involved in that action. And when a man and a woman create a child, they have an obligation of justice to care for that child. They created that child, they have an obligation to care for that child. Now in philosophy, the flip side of the obligation is a right, it's a rights claim. They're correlative truths, we say. So it follows that children have a natural right to be cared for by their biological mother and father, okay? They have a natural right to this. Now, a well-ordered society 
recognizes this and defends the child's right to be cared for the, by their mother and father by defining marriage as between one man and one woman. Basically, when marriage is properly defined, it is the only institution that recognizes this child's, this children's right, right? Unfortunately, in the United States, the redefinition of marriage not only trampled upon children's rights, it redefined parenthood, okay? So by legalizing gay marriage, the state has basically said that adults don't really have to stick around with children, that they can make children however they want and then walk away from the obligation and then out allow any other family structure to take over. So this has resulted in these very new family structures that up until now were never endorsed or applauded by law. So now we have gay men who hire a surrogate or an egg donor to help them create a child. And then she walks away from her obligation to care for her offspring, violating that child's natural right to be known and raised by his mother, all right? And most recently, we now have the first throuple group of three men, all three men listed on the birth certificate as the fathers of this child. But of course, by natural law, we don't know which of these men was the actual biological father and where the biological mother is, right? But when the law ceases to recognize the child's right, it's basically leaving the most vulnerable at the mercy of, strong, of the stronger. Explain this to your kids because kids have a very strong sense of justice and kids have a very strong sense of defending the underdog. So if you shine the spotlight on the true victim here, I guarantee it's going to be very effective. What's happening in the culture is that the LGBT movement wants to present themselves as the victim. They wanna say that the adults are actually the victims of injustice. And we can say, no, the real victims here are the children. Shine the spotlight on the kids. So unfortunately, um, this is a situation in our country right now, but you can say to your kids, we're pro-life and an extension of being pro-life is being in favor of children's rights. And we don't want children cut and pasted into whatever family forms the adults want to build. So that's why our family does not support gay marriage or any other alternative family structures that basically allow adults to walk away from their obligations to their children. But what about same-sex couples who adopt kids? Okay, so your teenager may be super bright and they may ask you this hard question. What about adoption? You know that a lot of kids will say, well, isn't it better for a kid to be adopted by a gay couple than to be shuffled around in the foster care system or you know, in an orf overseas orphanage somewhere? And this is actually a really hard one to answer, okay? So there are some extreme cases. Um, one of my colleagues at Canavox, um, she knew a, a same-sex couple of women who decided that they would adopt a little girl from China. This little girl needed four life-saving surgeries and she had been passed up for adoption for many months and she was in, in, in a dire straits, basically. She really needed to be adopted. And this same sex couple of women decided to step up to the plate and go overseas and adopt this little girl. She was in a, in a terrible orphan, orphanage conditions, right? And my goodness, I mean, in, that, in some of these extreme cases, we have got to admit, of course, it's better for that little girl to be in the home of two women who are willing to make sacrifices for her to have a better life, okay? However, would it have, have been even better for a mother and father to have adopted that little girl? Yes, it would have been even better because that little girl is still being denied the loving attention of a father figure, okay? So we can recognize that we live in a real world where the ideal is not always possible. And we permit suboptimal solutions for the sake of improving the lot of the child without saying that this is the ideal, right? So we can permit without promoting, okay? The thing to remember is that adoption does not exist to provide adults with children. Adoption exists to provide children with parents, okay? So the most important thing is for the social worker to make the determination, what is the best possible 
option I have for this child. And in the view of many people who I agree with, unfortunately, that social worker isn't always placing these children in the option of a mother and father home. It's now becoming completely normalized to place them in same sex homes, even when there are opposite sex couples available, all right? So we can say to our kids, there are extreme cases. And of course we recognize we need to allow for what's the best possible thing for these children, but the ideal continues to be the nuclear family. Okay, so that's the adoption. Okay, so what is transgender? Okay, so now I'm imagining you're talking to a young, a young child and we'll work our way up to older kids. So start at the beginning. When you're talking to a young child, you can say, okay, you know that the people you meet are either boys or they're girls. And you either have boy parts or you have girl parts. If you have boy parts, you have a boy body and that means you are a boy. And if you have girl parts, you have a girl body and that means you're a girl. You never need to be worried or confused about what you are. Just look at your body for the answer. And being a girl does not mean that you have to love pink and princesses and being a boy does not mean that you have to love frogs and swords. Boys and girls can love all sorts of things and it doesn't depend on any of those more superficial things. Being male or female depends upon your body, okay? Now, there are some people, you can explain, who are uncomfortable about being a boy or a girl for reasons that we do not understand. They struggle to accept their body and they say they would rather be the opposite sex. But they're confused because we can't really change our bodies, can we? So nevertheless, even though they can't, they'll say things like, well, I wanna be a girl because I'm, I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body or something like that. And those people call themselves transgender. A girl who says she's trans will try to dress like a boy and she'll try to have a name that's more like a boy and behave like a boy, but she's actually a girl, okay? It's a very sad thing. And you make sure you communicate to your children all these truths with a great deal of compassion. Now, if you have an older child, you can also hope with them that this transgender acquaintance will receive good mental health care because what they need is assistance to help them cope with the distress that they are feeling about being boy or a girl. Because ultimately what we want is for everybody to accept themselves, accept who they are biologically. Now you can also explain to a high schooler that transgenderism is very similar to body dysmorphia, which is somewhat similar to anorexia. In both cases, there's a disconnect between the reality and the person's mind, all right? And their per perception of themselves. So with body dysmorphia, a very, very thin person believes, is authentically convinced that they're fat, right? And they do dangerous things, restricting their diet because they want to lose weight. And in the case of a transgender individual, they believe that they're op the opposite sex and they try to change their bodies through dangerous activities like hormones or surgery. Just as we would never encourage a person with anorexia or a body dysmorphia to take to have liposuction, similarly, we should never encourage a transgender person to take hormones or go for the rest of their life into surgeries and other medical treatments. So explain with a great deal of compassion that these individuals are struggling and they can definitely reach out in friendship um, and hopefully be a shoulder to cry on. Number six, so how am I supposed to interact with people who think so differently or have an LGBT identity? So the short answer is courageously, with a great deal of friendship, always. Never imposing our views, but always ready to give an answer for what we believe, or at least always ready to ask thoughtful questions to help the other person reflect. And very importantly, always ready to pay the costs of saying the truth. So most traditionally minded families today tell their kids, don't hang out with those people. You know, don't hang out with that group. They're a little weird, just stay away from them. Let you let them be and you hang out with these people, just draw a line. And I think that approach instills uh, 
um, a lack of confidence in the truth. And I, I think it's a dereliction of our duty. We need courageous young people. We need courageous adults who are ready to live in the truth and not be afraid of other people finding out. We need to teach our children the truth and then model for them how we are willing to even suffer the costs of getting in there and saying the truth. I know it's really hard in this day and age. Um, believe me, I have kids in high school. Cancel culture is very strong. Fear of rejection is very high. Our kids live in a world where rejection is so much more painful than it ever was when we were young. This, the risks are much higher to their social status, to their name, et cetera. But I want to appeal to some words that um, uh, Cardinal George of Chicago said before he died. I always think of these words uh, in moments of difficulty standing up for my faith or from what I believe about marriage and sexuality. Um, he, was, he was reflecting on the situation of religious liberty in the United States. And he said that he did not recognize the United States that he was seeing right before his eyes. It was not the America that he grew up in. And then he said, I expect to die comfortably in my bed, but if things continue the way they're going, my successor will die in prison and his successor will die a martyr in the public square. And his successor will pick up the shreds of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization. So those words really struck me because right now, if we apply this to our case, the cost of speaking the truth, whether it's in a term paper with a teacher or quietly to a friend, the cost is losing our friends, losing social status, maybe getting a worse grade on the paper, having to deal with, with the cumbersome um, back and forth of defending our right to speak freely, et cetera. But those costs are relatively mild. And as I discovered with my own kids, when they get rejected by their peers for what they believe, eventually they get a friend upgrade, all right? Eventually they find another group of kids that is way better than the intolerant group that didn't want to accept them. But if we don't pay the costs now, if we don't up our game and learn to speak the truth and be who we are in our culture today and use our freedom to speak, our grandchildren are gonna to have to pay the cost of going to jail for speaking the truth of marriage and sexuality. And our great grandchildren will probably have to die martyrs in order to speak the truth. So I ask us to think very, very carefully about what the stakes are today that we really have a social responsibility to be courageous and teach our children to be courageous, to get in there, not, feel, not fear. Um, let me end with an invitation, an invitation to join Canavox because uh, you may know that we already have Canavox adult groups from, for many years. We've been having them since 2014, but this spring we just rolled out um, Canavox groups for high schoolers and for college kids, and also some for middle school. We call them uh, Canavox JV. Canavox JV for the high school and middle schoolers and Canavox Varsity for the college students. And what these groups are, um, it's five hours. The base course is just a crash course of five hours, either five days in a row for five hours or five weeks in a row, one hour each week with other like-minded students on Zoom with a dynamite Canavox state leader guiding them through readings and they're talking about these issues so that they can get basically a great formation in the natural law tradition on what the truth is of these matters. Um, and we have guys groups and then we have girls groups, they're separate. And if you're interested, uh, please just send us an email and we'll put you on the email list to receive the invitations for those courses on Zoom. So um, I'll end with that. And let me, let me turn now to, to the um, Q&A. Uh, that I think, let me see if I can figure out how to, how to do this Q&A. Um, okay, the first question is, um, will there be any downloadable printouts that summarize this presentation at the end of this? I can, I can send you all some summaries of the, like the gay script and the natural law script. 
And if you want, I can send you some, um, we have a couple of documents that we give for Canavox participants on some of the hardest questions, especially about same-sex attraction. And if you're interested in something else, I really invite you to just come to the Canavox website. We have free materials all over the place, videos, video presentations. This presentation is a summary of a very abridged summary of a, a, a series of three videos I filmed that are available on Canavox on this similar topics. So you can also check that out if you wanna see it. And then another person has asked, how should parents explain behaviors like dress, voice, mannerisms of effeminate men and masculine women to their eight to 12 year olds? So I think it will depend a lot on the context. All right, I think if, and if your kid is not really raising the issue, I don't know that I would draw that much attention to it to an eight-year-old, okay? But if they're interacting with somebody who is um, very, very flamboyant perhaps, all right? Or somebody they see very frequently, and especially if you're talking about a 10 to 12-year-old, if they come to you with questions or you can tell they're sort of visibly uncomfortable, go ahead and talk it through with them. You know, have a talky talk. I'll tell you that once I had a, um, a play date at my house and um, with a mom and she came over with her son and he had, um, he, her son had his nails painted purple. And my son played with the boy and acted like everything was normal. But afterwards my son asked, you know, why, why did this, why did he have his nails purple, you know? And so I talked, I said, yeah, I mean, I noticed it too. The moment they walked in, that's the first thing I noticed that his son was wearing purple nails. And so I talked it through with my son. I said, why do you think it's strange for a boy to have his nails painted purple, right? And he gave the right answer. He said, well, because that's usually something girls do. I was like, yeah, that's usually something girls do. Why do you think it might it might lead him to become confused. He's like, yeah, because if he's doing things that girls only do, it might make him confused that he's not a girl. So that's exactly right, you know? When people behave and choose to behave and seek out to behave in ways that are very much of the opposite sex, they can, they can start to convince themselves that they are of the opposite sex and it can lead to confusion down the line. Now, this might be a one-time isolated incident and this boy, never will paint his nails again, and it doesn't have any long-term impact on him. But it could be the start of a new habit, and these things can, can be very tricky, not so much for what the external is, but what that symbol represents to the person in their mind, what they're telling themselves in their mind. That idea is what's most tricky, right? So absolutely, I would just have a conversation with your child about whatever the scenario is and make sure that, yeah, just have a talky talk with them. Next question, um, will this presentation be available to watch again or post it on the Family Enrichment site? I believe it will be. I believe Texas Family Enrichment will be posting it. Um, next question, my brother is living a gay lifestyle and I'm struggling with how and when I expose my kids ages 14 to 20 or 14 to two. So, so, they're, so you have 14 is the oldest to him and his partner. I want to show him love and compassion without confusing my kids. Absolutely. So we have on the Canavox website, a few videos on this. Um, the videos are, it's part of our Dear Katie series. One of our state leaders films these, um, these videos with little Q and A like this. And we tackle one of, we had one viewer ask a very similar question. And basically her, the, the way, so, Basically, you want to sort of, it'll depend a lot on this on the situation, right? So if your brother and his partner are very, very um, physical in front of in front of other people, if they love to hold hands and kiss and they're very, very flirty, that will be part of the determination. Sometimes um, same-sex couples are very, they, they don't act at all romantic. And so it really depends a lot on the couple, okay? And whether or not they can are ready to respect your family's values. So hopefully you're going out of your way to meet them for dinner and to see them and to be in touch as friends, you know, be there for the birthday parties. Um, you know, as an adult, you can put your sister hat on, okay? And when you can be a great sister and be reach out in friendship, you can. But there are times when your mother hat is going to have to trump your sister hat, okay? And so you may decide, for example, that it's too risky 
for, for Christmas dinner to have them over because you can't be sure that they're actually gonna respect your family's values. Or you, know, you can't have them sleeping at your house together, right? Because in your home, you have certain rules. So anyway, so I, I do think that it, it is delicate. Um, and it's also gonna depend a lot on your kids' personalities, right? Some 14 year olds are super mature. They can handle it. You can have a, a, a like straight on conversation with them and tell them the dilemma bring them into the dilemma, right? Like this is a wonderful opportunity to start training your 14 year old about the real world and some of the difficult decisions that we have to make in these cases. Um, obviously the younger they get, I would be a little bit more cautious, you know? Um, maybe look for time like playground time or limit the, the situation so that it's, it's, it's a very kind of careful situation, you know? So you don't wanna, you don't wanna completely like blacklist him, you know, so it's gonna, it's gonna be a tricky one. Um, but check out some of our Dear Katie videos. And I think um, just click on the tag that says same sex friendship or same sex attraction, and you'll, you'll get a few videos, including invited to a same sex wedding and that kind of thing. Hopefully it'll give you fodder for, um, for discussion. Okay, next question. Our kids have a middle school teacher who is transitioning from a man who's starting to present, instead of a man, he's presenting as female. Should we push to avoid having him as a teacher? If not, how should we approach this situation? Excellent question. Okay, it's gonna depend a lot on whether this is a public school or a private school. Although now that the Equality Act may be coming upon us, um, the Equality Act could change everything, but at least for now, okay? If this is a public school, I, Okay, let's take, let's first take if it's a Christian school. If it's a Catholic school, I want you to be aware that the USCCB has a document called Male and Female, he created them. And the USCCB has given specific instructions to Catholic institutions about defending the truth of the Catholic tradition in our schools. So there are documents available. Rome has not provided guidance on this, but the USCCB has, okay? So if you're at a Catholic school, download the document, if you're, I, hopefully you're a PTA mom and you're very involved and you've got lots of friends and they know you from other situations, you've got a lot of social capital there and you can walk in with a smile on your face and say, hey, I have concerns about our, our school hiring somebody like this. And hopefully you can start a conversation. I do not recommend rallies or petitions or fights. I recommend the kind and polite way, one-to-one -one dialogue with a lot, without a lot of drama. If you are in a public school, it's gonna be different. I think, um, okay, this is middle school. Yeah, I think I would ask to, honestly, if this is a public school, even if it's a Catholic school, I think I would consider taking my child out of the school. Um, why? Because a kid is put in a very difficult position when they are at, on the one hand, we teach students to respect their teachers and honor their teachers. But if this teacher is going to be asking the students to use deceitful pronouns or asking them to endorse or right, be comfortable with behaviors that normally their internal alarms would be going off, right? We're actually putting our children in a very uncomfortable situation. They're minors and they're not quite ready to handle having a teacher. So I think I would um, let the public school know that I am pulling the kid out of the public school for this reason just so they know, just so they know they're gonna be losing a few taxpayer dollars because of that. Um, anyway, it's a tricky one, but uh, I would err on the side of caution with my kid. Do you believe a middle school teacher is mature enough to have a friendship with a transgender kid? As parents, we are afraid of adding, oh, a middle schooler is mature enough to have a friendship with a transgender kid. As parents, we are afraid of adding another layer of confusion to a difficult age. On the other hand, Limiting the friendship creates a wedge on intimacy. Any suggestions? I, it's gonna depend a lot on the middle schooler. Honestly, I think most middle schoolers can have a, a friendly acquaintance who's going through a difficult thing. But transgender kids, um, they're gonna have a lot of psychosocial needs, right? These are kids that are struggling, all right? These are kids that really need therapy. And in the case of any child who's in need of a lot of therapy and a lot of help, it's generally difficult for them to connect with children who are not in that place, right? So sometimes as parents, 
we have to say to our kid, you know, that child is in a really difficult situation. Be really nice to them. Be as kind as you can and be very forgiving because they may say some things that upset you, but they're, they're struggling. They're suffering a great deal. So it's really going to be, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that a very, very deep friendship is going to be possible, but I think that kindness goes a long way. I think that you know, bringing them something on their birthday, being polite, showing a gesture of friendship and, and love can go such a long way for a kid. Usually transgender kids are very socially isolated. Usually they're having a really hard time um, fitting into the gender roles that are expected of their sex. So if your son knows of a boy who wants to identify as female, your, your son extending friendship to that boy, or at least treating him like a normal kid, is already a notion of love to, to show that boy. So I'm not saying they have to be best friends or best buddies, or he has to have them over every weekend, but certainly teaching our children to, to be kind and to think of them and to do whatever is in their power to make that child comfortable. I think that's what friendship is, at least in the first levels of friendship. And yes, I do think that it's possible. I know parents are afraid of adding another layer of, conf of confusion, but a lot of kids can take it. And I think that our kids can grow big hearts towards the vulnerable and they will become better because of it. Okay, next question. Could you give a similar explanation when it is a sibling who has declared himself trans? How not to harm a three-year-old child and not cutting the sibling off? Okay. It's going to be, it's going to depend a lot on the age of the, the child who's identifying as trans. Okay. If you have a minor who is, I mean, this, yeah, this is among the most difficult situations, right? Because your loyalties are split. Um, it's going to be very difficult. I don't know that there's an ideal solution to this situation. And I think you should talk to a therapist to really get the best. I'm not a therapist. Um, if it is a child who is still a minor, they live under your roof, they have to obey certain rules under your roof, right? Because your three-year-old is the more vulnerable here and you need to protect your three-year-old, I think you need to lay down some ground rules about what is acceptable behavior, all right? And be ready to enforce those rules so that you protect your three-year-old as much as possible, all right? Um, yeah, I think you're gonna have to establish some boundaries, right? Some very clear boundaries. If it is an older child who is over 18, I think I would consider saying to them that if they're unable to live by the rules of the household, that they are gonna have very limited contact with your other children. I know that sounds very difficult and you can make time and space for that other transgender child in other areas, but I do think that you're gonna to need to set some very clear boundaries for the sake of protecting the very young children who are also under your care. Okay, maybe a couple more questions. Um, what would you advise um, when receiving invitations to ceremonies or parties from gay couples when one of them is your friend? How to be a good role model for your kids in this matter, but also charitable? Okay, we have a Dear Katie question on this as well on our Canavox website. It depends on the situation, okay? So if you're invited to a birthday party, if you go to a birthday party, what are you doing? You are tacitly saying with your actions, I'm celebrating your life. I'm happy you, you, you turned another year, right? I, think, I don't think there's any problem attending like a gay person's birthday, okay? Because you can completely celebrate their life unless you have reason to believe there, are in a, there will be inappropriate activities at this party or some other reason. But if it's just a normal, regular birthday party, I don't see why you can't go. Going to the movies. If you're an adult and you wanna to go to the movies with, with your gay friend and his partner, I don't see why you can't go to that. But a gay wedding, different matter. Because what do we do when we go to a wedding? We're tacitly saying with our actions, I endorse the, the sexual behavior of this couple. And that is an event that I cannot endorse with my behavior. And at a wedding, the audience is actually witnesses, right? They're, they can be legal witnesses. And so, I don't think you can attend a wedding and I don't think we can attend like housewarming parties either. That one's kind of on, on the fence, but I wouldn't attend a housewarming party either because again, it's sort of signaling things that I don't think I can tacitly consent to. Okay. But it's going to depend a lot on, on the situation and clear communication with your kids. You know, if your kids are wondering, talk to them about it, right? These are, these are wonderful opportunities to teach our kids. Okay. Last question. Um, 
We live in a predominantly gay neighborhood with three gay couples surrounding us. They are extremely friendly and very nice to our kids. They don't ever show PDA when they are with us. How do we help explain to our three and five-year-old girls that this is against the natural order? Okay, I have a, a video exactly on this, all right? So go to the Canavox website and check out, it's called Helping Our Children Navigate Gender Identity the Elementary School Years. So I have three videos, one specifically on elementary, one on middle school and one on high school. Um, and uh, keep it simple, all right? I think if, if, if it's just a pair of women, your three and five-year-olds are probably not gonna notice anything unless the same-sex couple has children, right? And if the same-sex couple has children, I think around the age of seven, eight, nine, I would start to tell my kids, yeah, they have two mommies and unfortunately they don't have a daddy. And, and you know, that's really sad because Daddies are so wonderful and every child needs a dad, right? I would probably start saying things like that so to help them process, but at the same time, be very warm and friendly and model for them how to be a wonderful neighbor to your neighbors. Very good. Um, I mean, there are more questions and I'm sorry to have to cut it off. Um, feel free to, to um, submit them to Pilar and she can send them to me. I'll be happy to answer them when there's more time. Thank you so much, Anna, for giving us this uh, wonderful and clear presentation of this difficult topic and, and giving us tools to equip ourselves as parents to better respond to these situations. We really appreciate. And as Anna, um, you know, encourages us throughout her talk to go to the Canavox website. This is a wonderful website, you know, full of resources that can really help you in, in continue your education on this important topic that unfortunately we we're surrounded by um, these kind of issues more and more so. So Anna, thank you again. And I look um, forward to having you all for our next uh, presentation lecture on April the 17th, given by Mr. Tim Record on the topic of showing your children that God has a role in their life. Thank you so much, Anna, again, and hope to have you all attend next session. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.